everybody, welcome. I'm Jeremy. Uh, I am the director of the Honors Program, and I'm pleased to welcome you all here for um, the third lecture in our ongoing uh, lecture series, um, the Art and Politics Lecture Series, where we take on urgent questions in politics and kind of the crisis times we're living in. Um, we take on serious questions about the direction and future of art, and we sometimes try to smush the two together. Um, and see where we get with it. Um, I'm uh, honored to welcome um, in what is an annual tradition now and really kind of one of the, the great um, uh, enthusiasms I have. Like I really look forward to it every fall. You know, November is like, well, Thanksgiving, that's going to be really good. And then also um, Francis Fox Pippen is going to join us and that's going to be really good. Um, Fran has been doing these lectures now for a series of years um, for people who are, uh, you know, freshmen or just joining us. Um, Fran is uh, an extremely distinguished scholar um, and author of many important books, um, some great fundamental important books. If you want to understand American politics, American political economy and social movements, um, Probably my favorite of the bunch is a book called Poor People's Movements, which is absolutely essential reading. Why they, uh, I forget the subtitle, maybe. Why they succeed that. and why they fail. There we go. <laughs> um, and uh, the that's one of my favorites, but there are also a whole lot of other amazing ones, including Regulating the Poor, a book about the welfare system in the United States, um, a book called... Uh, uh, Challenging Authority, How Ordinary People Can Change America, a book called Why Americans Don't Vote and Why uh, They Want to Keep It That Way, The Powerful Want to Keep It That Way, something like that. Um, another, uh, Keeping Down the Black Vote, um, very important analyses of um, the American political system, of social movements, um, and of the economic system. Um, Francis is also an activist of uh, repute, um, both, uh, she founded or was one of the founders of the National Welfare Rights Organization in the 60s, a group to advocate um, uh, and bring into movement activity um, welfare recipients, um, uh, a, a kind of um, uh, representation that we are sorely lacking in our society these days. Um, and she also was, you know, one of the main people responsible for the, mo what is sometimes known as the Motor Voter Act, which um, is, you know, when you get a driver's license, the DMV is required to offer you the right, um, the opportunity to um, uh, register to vote. And Francis was a key architect in that as an opportunity to uh, try to push against the tide of disenfranchisement in the United States um, which has been one of her lifelong um, activist activities. Um, so I could say many other things about Frances. Um, it's really a pleasure and an honor to have her with us. I believe she's coming to us from upstate, um, which is part of why we are uh, Zooming in today. And she's going to be sharing with us some reflections on the uh, outcome of the midterm elections and generally the kind of the rise of the right in American society and the prospects for American fascism um, in the present. Uh, generally, how we do these things is I'm going to hand the mic over to Fran, um, then she and I might bat it back and forth a little bit between the two of us, um, and then we'll have plenty of time, probably around 45 minutes for Q&A, so please write down your questions as they come up, and we will have time for um, as many of them as we can get to. Um, with that, um, it is my honor to welcome Dr. Professor Emeritus at CUNY of Political Science and uh, General um, Maven uh, Francis Fox Pivot. Thank you, Jeremy. So I suppose the place to begin is to wonder what happened yesterday uh, in American politics or in world politics. Did we have a victory? I'm not sure, but I do think that we got a kind of reprieve. All of the press and the usual 
quote, experts were predicting a red tide, a Republican uh, sweep. And they were predicting that partly because uh, midterm elections usually turn against the party in power and the party in power or the party in a sort of power was the Democratic Party. That did not happen. Trump and Trump's hand-picked candidates did not sweep the election. Uh, and a, a, a number of races are still undecided, but it looks as though the Congress is going to be divided. Uh, the Democrats may hold the House. No, the Democrats may hold the Senate, but the Republicans are more likely to take the House. Uh, so it's a kind of standoff. And at the same time, some good things happened in the election. Uh, the, a number of states passed constitutional amendments uh, that would protect the right to abortion. That included Michigan, California, Vermont. Uh, and it's also true that this happened in the face of a huge expenditure of money on the part of uh, Republicans, uh, a, an expenditure which permitted them to persuade the American public that crime, street crime, was a major problem in American society and should be the basis for their voting against Democratic office holders. And uh, so the smart money, which was projecting the red tide and the red tide that would sweep over our government, did not happen. And the and this is not only in the face of historic patterns, which usually predict that the party out of power will gain in the midterms, but it also happened in the wake of an unprecedented series of efforts by Republicans to game the system and to game the system by distorting the elemental procedures through which people get to vote. Now, we could have discussions, endless discussions about what democracy means. We would some of us would agree, some of us would disagree, but everybody would agree that democracy means that most people have the right to vote for the people who hold the highest offices in the land, governmental offices in the land. And the gaming of the system by the Republican Party was an effort to interfere with that elemental process of democracy, to stop it from happening. And why? Because they didn't think they could win. They didn't think that most people would vote for them. And to, to make that, ha to, to, to interfere with that elemental process, they did all sorts of things introducing new rules, crazy rules. You heard about some of this. People, it was no longer legal to give people water when they were standing on line to vote. It, for example, drop boxes were eliminated or reduced so that it would be harder for people to deposit their ballot at a place where it would get to the clerks who counted the ballots. Uh, the intimidation of prospective voters by volunteers who carried arms and guarded the voting places or guarded the drop boxes. Uh, so all of this kind of thing was in a way foiled by the fact that Turnout was pretty high. It was pretty high among Democrats and Republicans. 
And we pretty much came to a kind of standoff where probably the Democrats will get the Senate, will win the Senate, and the Republicans will win the House of Representatives, and we have a, re, a Democratic uh, president. And this in spite of gerrymandering, rule changes, courts, all of the interferences that a highly organized and very wealthy, splashing with money part, political party can throw into the game. So. What does that mean? I think it means that we have a reprieve, a kind of, we've been given some space to try to organize, mobilize, to defend the elemental and essential dimension of our governmental system that is the voting part of the system uh, so that we, we hold on to it uh, in the face of a fascist movement that is sweeping the world. But it's also the case that we that we that we're on the precipice of losing elemental rights, that we might lose the right to vote, for example, that this reflects deeper problems, much deeper problems. And some of them problems you know, because we repeat them all the time. We name them all the time, and we don't do very much about them. One problem, one kind of problem, is the enormous role that money and the advertising that money buys plays in our elections. The Republicans spent about $50 million dollars in this midterm election. Yeah. And it's because they spent that kind of money that they could persuade Americans that crime was a major problem and the problem that they should address when they went into the voting booth. Uh, and on the one hand, we have a political party empowered by money with the mouthpiece that is made available to them by advertising, yelling about what it is that you should care about. And on the other hand, we have the actual complexity and obscurity of public policy and the government's system. So what makes this so important is that this is the very essence of democracy. What, what is it? What, what is democracy? What means that people can assess whether the government is working for them? And in order to assess whether the government is working for them, they have to look around them, consider their living circumstances, whether they earn enough whether there's food in the cabinet, whether their children are safe, all the kinds of things that people care about. And only if, if, if in a way, if they, the, the government in power passes the test on these criteria, do you vote for them to stay in power? If things are not right, if the schools are not educating their children, or if they're not safe in the streets, if they're not earning enough money, if they can't afford to pay the rent, then they might vote the bastards out. And, and that's what democracy is to many ordinary people, to most ordinary people. Can I live the life I need to live? And if I can't, the government has to go. So, Now, how do people know whether things are okay for them? How do they know? How do, how do they look around and decide whether they have enough groceries, whether they can pay the rent, whether their children are being educated, whether the health care that they get 
is adequate. How do they know that? Well, you would think that they would be able to tell, right? It's their life. It's a kind of elemental enlightenment idea. They should be able to tell whether they're better off or worse off than they were under the last regime. But it's not as simple as that because the advertising that campaigns do has a lot to has a lot of influence over whether people think that their life is okay, that their kids are being educated in the school, that it's safe to walk in the streets. People blaring at them all the time about crime or about inflation or about the price of gas or about this or about that has an influence on their assessment, even of their own reality. Never, never mind the reality of other people or that reality expanded over large numbers of people. So money and advertising in politics really always matters. But I think that there's another development that is a little bit different than usual. And that is the rise of something like cult-like thinking in the United States and elsewhere. Now, you know, I'm not sure about this, but I think that there's something different in the cult-like thinking than simply listening to candidates blaring about crime in the streets or the price of gasoline. For uh, the example that I like to think about has to do with a Trump campaign rally in Michigan, in which Trump told the assembled MAGA acolytes, he said, aren't you glad about all the automobile plants that I brought back to Michigan? And the crowd roared their ap approval. Now, I find that very frightening because Trump did not bring any automobile plants back to Michigan. What is it, what does it mean when a charismatic leader can tell people that there are automobile plants in your neighborhood? Something weird is going on. And I think the, the one way to understand it is that it is the thinking of a cult, which is very different from the kind of thinking that we associate with the democratic tradition, where people are capable of assessing their own circumstances, of deciding whether they're earning more money, of deciding whether their children are safe, whether people can, where people can think. And because they can think, they know whether they're better off or not. They don't listen to a leader to find out. So the kind of campaigns through which governments change in the United States uh, and the way in which people are enlisted in these campaigns is also part of what happened uh, during the election. And the fact that the Republicans lost, that Trump did not win, that his candidates did not win, should be taken as a kind of a kind of a victory. The at least in the sense that uh, 
Trump is no longer going to be the kind of charismatic, undefeatable leader that he was thought of. There's There are other features of the election that are very important and that are, should be important, especially to you. One is that the youth vote broke with the pattern of voting in the American public in general. The youth vote was very democratic. That's extremely important, partly because young people are going to be around longer and partly because it's a constituency that has energy and that can stand up to uh, Trump and the cult leaders. Let's call them the cult leaders. Uh, the There also were victories for the pro-abortion uh, movement among women. And there were signs, especially of cleavages, for example, in the Latino vote, where women broke with uh, the modest trend of Latino men to vote for Republicans. And perhaps the abortion issue was important in that happening. The What else? What else was important? Oh, DeSantis was very important. We have, Trump was probably defeated in a sense in this election in that his handpicked candidates often did not win. But meanwhile, uh, much smarter and more elite politician uh, from Florida, the governor of Florida, uh, DeSantis, uh, won big in the election. And I suspect that he may be the new face of the Republican Party that Trump, Trump will go down and that DeSantis will assume the leadership. And this is something to worry about because he's a smart guy. He's also a member of the elite. Trump, I don't know what, whether Trump is a member of the elite. He's certainly rich, uh, but he always felt that he was from Queens. DeSantis is not from Queens. DeSantis was educated at the very best schools, and he feels himself to be a member of the ruling class. And that is extremely important in the future of American politics. So I guess the question that we all want to ask ourselves is what should we do now? And that's a question I think that we should actually discuss. The the question can be can be posed as a question about whether we should work with within the Democratic Party, or we should work with labor unions, or we should work with social movements? What are the options for holding on to American politics and the democracy that we, the limited democracy that we do have in the United States? And that's a question I think we should uh, discuss. Jeremy, do you have an opinion about that? Because you're a member of DSA, <laughs> a very active member of DSA. And you are working on, you do do political work. What do you think you do? And why do you think it's important? I mean, yeah, I guess my feeling is um, that there is still like a, 
it seems to me like still a kind of a hole in American politics where like a vision of where American politics is headed should be um, that on the one hand um, we have the rise of this far right, but that often seems to be engaged in what you were saying, sort of magical thinking. And then on the other hand, there is this sort of like centrist vision that, I mean, you know, insofar as, insofar as another story potentially of this election was the Republicans put up a series of extremely unpopular candidates. Um, the lack of a, a vision of any kind about like the, you know, inflation, about the economy, about where the country is heading coming from the Democrats also meant like a very narrow close shave. So it does seem to me like, you know, there is a definite absence of like vision and independence and independence from big money in American politics, which is super important. Um, also, it seems like an exciting time for the labor movement. Uh, a lot of people organizing um, Amazon, Starbucks, uh, you know, there's an animation union in New York City that recently organized. I mean, just uh, animators union um, to speak to SVA. Oh, <laughs> I never thought about that. An animators union. Yeah. I they... thought of animators as a trade, actually. <laughs> yeah. And really interestingly, actually, they kind of organized industrially because um, it is animators, but it's also people who work down the line, who work on sound, who work on other aspects, because a lot of them come from the same schools. They have the same training um, and are sometimes, you know, pitted against each other. Anyways, we could go into that. But um, it's, uh, you know, my students will get to hear a little bit about that in a couple weeks. But um, but yeah, so it seems like the labor movement, it's a time of huge possibility. Um, also, the need for political action, independent political action, getting involved politically, super important. I don't know. Does that <laughs> does, does that answer your question, Fran? <laughs> well, that's the... Those are obvious paths through which we can try to change American politics and tamp down the influence of the right, because the right has had growing influence in the United States and all over the world. Uh, one way is to try to strengthen labor unions or to try to grow labor unions in industries that have not been unionized, like Amazon. Uh, another way is to try to uh, revive the Democratic Party. And that's a real problem. I mean, if you look at the Democratic Party in New York State and New York City, it's a scandal as far as I'm concerned. From my point of view, uh, it is... Uh, a large part of the reason uh, that we are going, we are probably not going to win the House uh, for the Democrats. And New York, New York is a Democratic city and a Democratic state even. Uh, it's all, but it's always been a Democratic city. And it's one of the strongholds of democracy in terms of, of capital D democracy, uh, in terms of the political affections of its citizens, but its leadership is nothing to be proud of. And uh, I think that we could change that. I think that the squad is trying to change that. I think that AOC is an upcoming leader who probably will change that. But she certainly can't do it alone. Uh, but what we usually don't think of when we think of long-term change are social movements. And social movements are they're very important historically. They don't get the acknowledgement that the sort of more traditional paths of social reform get. But social movements have been the main lever of humanitarian transformation in American history. 
Uh, the, the real reason we have labor unions at all is because of a labor movement, a movement among workers, a movement that was tough and rough and successful, ultimately, although it took a long time. Uh, or why do we have civil rights and why have Americans attitudes about race improved, although not nearly enough, because one of the reasons for the MAGA movement and Donald Trump is that he has revived American racism and nationalism and uh, religiosity. But the advances that we've made with regard to race relations have been almost entirely due to the uprising of uprisings of Black people and Hispanic people themselves and the allies they were able to win from sympathetic whites. So uh, th there's a lot to do. And it's not inevitable that we'll do it. We may not. And, you know, we have to do it because Climate change is big and it gives us a very short time horizon. We, there are all the old reasons that we have to do it. Inequality is so serious in the United States. We are one of the most unequal countries in the world. That's a big reason, sure, but we have to do it for survival. So. That seems right to me. I mean, you know, and we are living through something of a time of movements, right? A, you know, this period, I mean, so we've seen kind of the rise of a far right in the recent, you know, the last like 10 years, really. We've also seen the rise of a kind of new, new left. Um, politically uh, in countries across the globe. I mean, think about Latin America, with, where almost basically every country is now um, uh, has a left-wing government, um, every major Latin American country, um, which is even more dramatic a shift than the pink tide, arguably. Um, but on the other hand, yeah. And on the other hand, we have seen a time of movements um, from Occupy Wall Street to Black Lives Matter, um, uh, to, uh, you know, even phenomena that were maybe a little more uh, kind of flash in the pan, but things like the Women's March or the Immigrants' Rights protests um, in 2017 with Trump. Um, on the other hand, as you always point out, Francis, you know, movements have kind of their own ebb and flow. So it's hard to figure out. I mean, I, I, I would love for there to be a national abortion rights movement, um, and think it's super important, especially in the South. Say. I think it's already begun. It's already here. Listen, the, some of the big victories of this election were by the abortion rights movement, the changing of constitutions of three states are a victory, are a victory. And Kentucky too, right? The, the voting Kentucky down, I mean, Kansas, Kentucky. And uh, I think that the Republicans are taking a beating over abortion rights. And that's partly the movement. And the movement will grow because the right to abortion is so essential uh, to the well being of women. The one I'll I'll open it up for I think general Q and A in a second. The one, or well, two other things I wanted to ask. Like one is you know you talked about um, New York and specifically the role of New York, and it is to me quite worrisome that like actually you know in some ways the states that moved farthest to the right in these midterms were Florida and New York State um, in different ways, um, but that is notable and noticeable. And I wonder if you have a thought as to why New York State in that regard, was it because of 
just, you know, very poor infrastructure on the part of the state Democratic Party, a calcified establishment? Was it because Kathy Hochul was not a particularly inspiring or serious candidate and ran a less serious campaign, I think, than her Republican opponent? Um, uh, yeah, so I'm curious about that. And then the other question, I well, I'll come to the other question. Let's do that one first. New York. I don't think we have the information to answer the question about what happened in New York yet, but we will have it. Uh, we, we have to know more. Uh, we need a more fine-grained analysis of the voting ter- uh, patterns in New York. You know, there is a very long-standing pattern in the area of New York City and its surrounding uh, suburbs and exurbs where New York City is always uh, much further to the left. It's an immigrant city. And uh, it was, for example, a very strong uh, pro pro FDR city. But the suburbs and the exurbs around New York are in part sensitized uh, and hostile to the immigrant and distinctive politics that the immigrants population of New York uh, harbors. So that uh, there was a very famous incident after World War II where Paul Robeson, a legendary Black leader and um, musician and actor, gave a concert outside of New York City. And the people who went to the concert were stoned by masses of local residents who gathered at the exits to throw stones at the attendees of this concert. And there was quite a bit of physical damage of of, uh, injury that was the result of that event. But, you you know, I grew up in New York and I I remember when my father got his first secondhand car, uh, we drove out of the city because my my father loved... uh, rural areas, and we drove all the way up to uh, Saranac Lake in the Adirondacks, and at some time during the day, we stopped, and my father knocked on a door, and he asked the man who answered the door if there was a place where we could stay that night in the locality, and I looked at the man and I looked at my father and I could just feel the hostility of the guy who answered the door. And for the first time, I realized that my father had an accent. I didn't, I hadn't ever known that. I hadn't ever heard the accent, but boy, did I feel it that afternoon. And that's the way it was. And that's the way it still is. It still is. Uh, I spend a lot of time up, uh, upstate. And uh, I have a, a friend of sorts. He's a Mexican guy who works on lo- taking care of local houses. And he tells me, he coaches a soccer team at his kid's high school. And he tells me how angry other parents can be when his team wins a game. So New York City has always been, in a way, in the middle of the race wars, even though it's not internal to the city as much as it, it has to do with a war between the city and its surroundings. Which is a sort of larger pattern in American politics right now, the kind of rural yeah. urban divide. I mean, I will say 
just anecdotally, you know, I do think there's some promising stuff in New York State. You know, Sarah Hanna, uh, Shrestha, who's a Nepalese immigrant socialist, won in the Mid Hudson Valley in Kingston, um, a state assembly seat um, as as a socialist um, outside New York City, which hasn't happened for a long time. Um, Kingston is different. It yeah. really is. There's a lot of housing activism in the Kingston area, for example, uh, that you don't see all over the state by any means. That's true. I believe they just lowered rents. The Rent Stabilization Board actually lowered. 15%. That's incredible. Um, I'm going to hand it over to everybody uh, for general q and I already see the chat is starting to pop off. The, the last thing, though, I wanted to ask Francis is just you mentioned in correspondence between us that there's still plenty of damage that some of the forces that you've been describing could do, even having not won an election. And I just wanted to hear just your thoughts about that. Um, and then we'll yeah. open it up for general Q&A. Well, I'm afraid uh, that unless there is a big surge of activism on the left, I'm afraid that the MAGA movement will be with us for quite a while. And it brings with it, because it seems to be the essential dynamic of the movement, part of the essential dynamic of the movement, it brings with it a celebration of violence and cruelty, uh, which I don't think we've ever seen in such an intense way in my experience of American politics. Can, I mean, can you imagine somebody breaking into a house and getting resting a hammer away from an 82 year old man and then hitting him on the head and cracking his skull? I mean, I think that uh, I sense this in Trump's appeal, the kind of public appeal he makes to his audience. Do you remember when he used to celebrate uh, wrestling matches? And I think he likes it. I think he loves it. And I think a lot of other people do too. I, I'm, I worry about that. I think we have the capacity for that in our people. And I worry about the cultivation of that kind of strand in American politics. That is what happened in Germany. Of course, much else ha happened in Germany as well. But certainly the violence and the cruelty were an important part of the appeal of German Nazism and of Mussolini's uh, followers as well. And I think it, that we have to stop that from happening in the United States. It's a very good thing, for example, that many of the people who were arrested in connection with the January 6th assault on the Capitol have been given jail terms. That's good. We've got to intimidate these people. Keep them quiet because you can't wring it out of them. It's not human nature. It doesn't happen that way. People retain the capacity for cruelty and violence, but we've got to make it costly for those who want to indulge it. Um, okay, I'm going to open us up for Q and A, um, and I see a few questions in the chat already, and I'll just invite. Um, uh, uh, people to ask their questions directly. So the first person I see is Maria. After Maria, if people, you're welcome to type your question in the chat as people have been doing, or if you'd like to get in line, feel free to, you can use the raise your hand emoji, or you can write stack in the chat like I'm writing now. Um, so Maria, do you want to ask your question? Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Jeremy. And thank you, Francis, again, for being here. It's always a pleasure to hear you speak. Um, I first want to apologize for the spelling mistake that was, I didn't want to like then double post, but you were talking about a different divide 
Um, and it just made me think about all the comments that I hear about the educational divide and how the parties are also splitting along just college educated versus not college educated. Um, I know that I believe it was Malcolm X who said education is everything and our ability to, you know, uh, exercise our brain and our critical thinking is also critical to democracy. So I was, I was wondering, you know, do you see an education divide too? What do you think is the future of that? Maybe speak on the education divide. Well, I I think there is something of an education divide, uh, but it's uh occur if it if it is there it is between the working class and uh, a kind of petty bourgeoisie just over the working class just beyond the working class and i think that the educational difference between these two groups is not what's important about them uh if you I mean, the, the leader of the Oath Keepers, for example, or uh, DeSantis himself, these are people that are highly educated. I don't see them as uh, humanists. I don't see them as intellectuals or philosophers that should lead us. I think they are uh, harsh, opportunistic, violent, cruel and destructive of the good things about American culture and American society, because there are some good things when we are in a kind of critical mode, we try to, we tend to forget them, but they, there are, but the, the idea that the working class is defined uh, by its educational uh, deficits, so to speak, uh, is I think not not really very helpful uh, because the working class is not leading uh, the MAGA movement. The MAGA movement is being led by highly educated, as it happens, elites who are opportunistic and heedless about the consequences of what they're doing. Thank you. Um, so I see we have two questions about Texas in the chat, in fact. So maybe we can have those people ask those together. So Emmett, do you want to go first? And then Danny? Yeah. So I had a friend in Texas um, who was quite upset and quite concerned about Greg Abbott's victory again in Texas. And I know he and DeSantis are often compared and put on the same level. So I wanted to know uh what you think about texas considering how uh politically charged that state is and how uh how many intense things have been going on there and how important as a red state it is right now and then maybe danny did you want to ask your i think related question oh yeah um my question was specifically about how we can fight uh voter suppression and uh gerrymandering because, um, you know, the gerrymandering is very intense in Texas. And I feel like they also probably face like things like intimidation. So is there a way we can fight that? Because um, I see that online, like anecdotally, like a lot of people were ac- upset with the um, the results in Texas, despite all their efforts. Well, gerrymandering and voter suppression are the name of the game, of the Republican game as it's been played uh, over the last decade or so. I mean, here's basically what happened. Uh, As a result of uh, demographic changes in the United States, the Republicans decided that they could not win elections by winning the support of the voting population. And so what was the solution? They would dismantle elections or they would prevent people from getting to the polls. That's been their strategy for the last decade. And it's a strategy that 
has an impact on turnout, who turns out, and therefore who can win elections. Uh, there's, there's a solution to this. And the solution is to outlaw the devices that, the, that have been used to inhibit people from getting to the polls so that they can, so that they can vote and to also guarantee the integrity of the vote count, the ballot count. Those are the solutions. And we, there have been efforts to impose those solutions. John Lewis uh, introduced legislation to try to shore up American elections, for example. But those solutions have not been have, have not been legislated. They could be, though. It's, it's not outlandish. In fact, it would. Practically speaking, mean restoring features of the Voting Rights Act that the Republicans in the Congress uh, dismantled. So, yes, voter suppression, very important. S voter intimidation of all kinds is very important. And and we can we can fight against those moves. We have to identify them, publicize them, and we have to organize. And we have, can't all, only organize within the Democratic Party because the Democratic Party is ambivalent about voter suppression. Any politician knows that they don't want new voters. And the Democratic Party is therefore a weak instrument for fighting for the expansion of voting rights. We have to do it with movement strategies as well. All right. Thank you so much. And did you, um, to the first question, Fran, did you want to speak to Greg Abbott? I don't know much about Texas. Uh, so I'd like to hear some, from somebody who does. Does somebody know about Texas? I know I hate Greg Abbott, but that's not what you wanted to hear. I know a little, little bit uh, from my friend who lives there. Um, he was in a lot of fear because he was, he's, he's a transgender guy. And when he moved to Texas for college, even though he had started um, me medically transitioning while living, while living in New England legally, when he moved to Texas, it became illegal. So he was stuck in a really unfortunate position for that. So where even if he had done this legally, his parents and his family were now at risk. His sister is now at risk. Um, luckily, he has turned 18, so that has since cleared up. But I know he's very concerned about his younger sister and the education that she is receiving and making sure that she receives a factual education now that she's also living in Texas as like a six or seven year old just now going to school. There's a lot of concerns there for how he is treating people uh, with both uh, abortion laws and gender laws and regard regarding all of that. It's quite concerning. Thank you. I mean, I also think just from my own um, understanding, I mean, he seems to be another one like DeSantis, actually, that's rode the wave of kind of. COVID politics and the complex ways that kind of people's experience around the pandemic and, you know, the, the sense of sort of just how strange these last few years have been, um, that, that, that has played into their popularity and the growth of their popularity. I mean, DeSantis seems very clear, but I think Abbott also this kind of like the anti-masking thing, but also speaking to you know, people's general just sense of like exhaustion and despair over the length of the pandemic and the feeling of, you know, kind of having given up hope on any sort of rational response as a society. Uh, yeah, so that that's just one other thought about how COVID is kind of affected in a deep way, I think, some of our politics. I think that's very important. Uh, there have been a lot of studies 
of the way in which the black bubonic plague affected uh, the culture and rationality, actually, of societies around the globe that were smitten by the plague. And we had a plague. And we're still, we still have a plague, actually. Uh, if you, I don't know if you follow the daily reports on the numbers of people hospitalized because of COVID, but there are still lots of people who are struck down by COVID. Uh, and you got to sort of get into the heads of other people to appreciate how crazy that can make you. How cra- and so it creates a kind of susceptible constituency for politicians who want to appeal to the irrationality and the magical thinking of crowds. That, so it's a strange time in American politics, or maybe not just in American politics, a strange time in the politics of people around the globe because the monsters are loose and the monsters are controlled by supernatural forces. After all, if you don't understand it, it's supernatural. Don't you think? Um, I'm going to hand it to, to Kate, to Christiane Molina. Do you want to ask your question? Hi, Francis. Thank you so much, and Jeremy, for um, hosting this this talk. Earlier, you um, you did mention something about you were talking about um, education and um, the new generation of voters um, that had a wide turnout this election. Also, you had this anecdote about um, accents, right? So I just was thinking about you know the, um, critical race theory and it's uh, <clears throat> and how it's um, could be implemented with um, for people's movements, right? Having language around voting, language democracy that's accessible to to different uh, social classes um, and cultures that maybe might feel um, <clears throat> alienated to the language of politics, right? So um, I just wanted to see what your thoughts were or kind of a little bit more in detail in critical race theory curriculum and the language of, and the pedagogy of activism. Thank you. Or right, I think I sh- should first make the point that I don't think that the people who are yelling about critical race theory are talking about critical race theory at all. They don't pay it. They don't know what it is. And they don't read the writings of people who are critical race theorists. Uh, it, it just has become a slogan of the white nationalists who are at the center of the MAGA movement. Uh, the, as for critical race theory, as, as it is, as it exists, and as it's practice, I think it's basically uh, correct in its assumption that American e- e- the American educational system is influenced by American racism. How could it be otherwise? We are, we have always been a racist country. We are infected by racism and by nationalism. The, can we make progress in restraining it and isolating it? Yes, of course. And we have, and we have to make more progress, but we are racist. Um, I'll hand uh, the mic over to Wanting. Um, as before, you talked about like how um, we should take action now because the environmental problem is um, right in front of us. And um, speaking of that um, whole event, uh, uh, environmental protection like stuff, um, do you think 
um, other politicians, like sometimes they uh, support it, sometimes they ignore it. But do you think they like truly like in general, do you think the parties truly have that um, concern in their mind or they're just using it as a strategy to uh, win the voters just, just to um, appear to our favorites? And do you think that like if the masses, like the public is pushing them to make actions that like they only respond like, okay, yeah, like you all those people, they're forcing, like they're protesting, they're forcing us to do something. We have to do something or they will like um, vote us out. So they will take action or they will like um, ever make a radical actions, like trying to solve this problem. Because I believe like in any people who had the, a long-term view will think an uh, environmental problem is the biggest problem that we're facing right now. Um, but because humans, we are a short-term animals, like sometimes we never consider like um, situations in, uh, expect what we eat um, for tomorrow. So many people don't really think that is an urgency because uh, the crisis might not happen to our generations in our lifetime, but it will happen and it will surely happen um, some days. So um, do you think what will be like the the ultimate solution like in um, political view to this problem? Well, I don't expect politicians to be sincere. I think the important thing is to pressure them whether and to act in ways that improve our future and improve our chances of having a future. Uh, and I don't expect them to, I don't expect, for example, a Joe Manchin who owns a coal mine. I'd ex I don't expect him uh, to care about the environment and to shut down his mind. He won't. But I think we could make him do it. We could organize a movement that would force him to close down his mind. And when he closes down his mind, I personally don't care whether he wants to do it or doesn't want to do it. I just want to make him do it. And that's true of the big fossil fuel companies. They don't want to roll back the production of fossil fuels. They don't want to support legislation that would make it more expensive and difficult to use fossil fuels. I don't care if they want to do it or don't want to do it. I think we have to make them do it because our future depends on it. And there are more of us than there are of them. Lots more of us than there are of them. You know, uh, during the Chartist movement in England, uh, which was a great democratic movement, a mo an early movement for democracy, uh, the slogan that was used to describe the democratic rank and file was the many. We are the many. They are the few. And the many should prevail, not the few. Also, for given we have an audience of artists here, that's a line from uh, Shelley's, uh, uh, Percy by Shelley's poem, the mask of anarchy, right? Ye are many, they are few. Uh, and <laughs> Shelley, Shelley also said... The movement. He got it from the movement. <laughs> um, the stack is open. Um, if people have further questions, I had one. I'll go with now because I don't see anyone yet, but please line up. Um, another question, Fran, is you talked about like a standoff situation, and I'm wondering what you think are sort of the consequences of that and what should be the consequences of that for people thinking about movements, about trying to move forward politics. I mean, already, honestly, even with democratic control of the three chambers, the last couple of years, I think for a lot of people have proven rather disappointing, kind of deflating, um, a sense of, you know, kind of 
optimism maybe that there was a more ambitious agenda coming out of the Biden administration at first and then kind of boredom and, and kind of like uh, just sort of loss of energy around kind of not seeing much happen. I imagine that's going to even more be the case in the next couple of years if Republicans do have the House. So what, you know, what kind of demands, what kind of um, uh, energy is possible to inject into for people not to just feel like politics is, you know, nothing can happen there and to get become more cynical and that cynicism leading more potentially to despair or to aggression or etc. Well, I disagree with your description of the Biden administration implied in the question. I think that uh, the Biden administration has been extraordinary, that it's put forward policy initiatives. And despite the fact that it did not control both houses of Congress, has managed to get much of, of its agenda through the Congress that are, have had a remarkable impact, actually, on poverty in the United States. Uh, the redistribution forced by Bi Biden initiatives is virtually unprecedented. And it occurred despite the fact that the movement the Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter movement was there. But in, in the big picture of things, there wasn't a powerful movement forcing Biden to do this. Biden did it. And he did it because of some of his advisors. Or it's less important to know why he did it than to know that he did it and that we should support the initiatives. and exercise pressure to retain them, because if the Republicans do take the House, they'll try to destroy them. The child tax credit, for example. You know how long people have been fighting for that kind of cash supplement to the incomes of poor families, poor women and children? This is an incredible initiative. And uh, so I don't think Biden has gotten credit for what he's done. And partly it's because he's not a good politic and not that part of politics is not what he's good at. He's not a good speaker. Trump is a better speaker. Trump is appalling and his policies are disgraceful, but he's a better speaker than Biden is. Uh, and we need more people who can talk to the people more leaders who can talk to the people. Uh, so I, I don't think Biden should be the target of our criticism. I'm not sure that I, he should be the candidate of the Democratic Party for president in the next election either, because he is old and he does seem a little bit weak. Uh, but so it's not an argument for another term for Biden. I haven't made up my mind about that. But I do think that just in human terms, this man deserves credit for extraordinary policy initiatives, which most of which he got through. Totally fair. I, I could give a few caveats. The child tax credit has expired already. Um, and, you know, they weren't able to get it through Manchin. Um, and I was more speaking about this from summer 2021 to the present. I agree. The first part of 2021 was like a very, very strong showing for an American presidency. And the climate bill is a pretty strong showing, yeah. too. I mean, I, I, I agree with that, too. I, I was speaking maybe a little more subjectively about people's feelings. But I think you're right about political communication there. Um I see Emmett, do you want to do another question? Go for it. Yeah, this whole conversation has been, real, has been really interesting. So I wanted to thank you for that. But I've seen a lot of people talking recently about the Supreme Court. It's a very important part of our democracy. And it's currently controlled by Republicans. And I've seen a push in recent years for 
Supreme Court term limits since serving until willful retirement or death is kind of concerning with you could have people on for an incredibly long time on in such an important, powerful position. And at that point, those decisions should be in the hands of the young people who will continue to be affected by them for the rest of their lives. So I wanted to know if you think getting a term limit passed for the Supreme Court would ever be possible. And if you think that's like a feasible goal for, for, for us. I think the Supreme Court, uh, look, we have a governmental structure that was created uh, in the aftermath of the American Revolution. And it was created by the founding fathers who were also American elites, big landowners, merchants, who wanted to curtail the influence of the revolutionary forces that had made the revolution possible. And they did that by creating barriers in the barriers to democracy in the American governmental structure. One of those barriers was the Senate. This has been a terrible problem for the entirety of American history, political history. Two senators from each state. Why is that democratic? Why does Montana have as much representation in the Senate as California or New York with the millions and millions of people? And the, and the Supreme Court is another barrier to democracy. And part, part of what makes it an effective barrier is that these guys are named for life, for life. And they're named, they're not elected. So I think we should get rid of the Supreme Court. For the entirety of American history, the Supreme Court has stood as a barrier to the rights of labor. Consistently, inevitably, until they were threatened by FDR, who was going to pack the court. But in the absence of that threat, the Supreme Court is an instrument of American elites who are the few, not the many. So, I think we should tr we should try to get term limits. We should try to expand the court. And ultimately, I want to get rid of it or make it an elected body. Why do you think the court is not elected? Because it's an anti-democratic institution. That's why. It, it's devised, devised as a barrier to democracy. And watch out for it now because it now has six conservative appointees. It's very dangerous. Uh, Richard has a question. Having been a working class kid all my life and a member of many unions, including a good friend with the Joseph Curran, the founder of the NMU, um, I'm not surprised by the violence and hatreds uh, embedded within Americans as we know them. Um, and I'm just wondering, for me, it's always been just there because it's a lived experience. Um, so I wonder if the ideological frameworks that we claim towards liberalism have been simply just blind to this, or I've been struck by the fact that they don't seem to account for that, the irrationality, as you referred to it earlier, as a natural kind of given, uh, aside from you know, mounting power, power structures to compensate, you know, which is as old as the 20th century, at least. So I'm just wondering if you see weaknesses within the liberal, classical liberalism that's been applied that may or may not account for what I've observed is kind of a basic, call it American nature, if you will. 
you know, I don't think you, human nature <coughs> is a construction of the enlightenment. Uh, I don't think we are by nature entirely rational creatures. We have a capacity for means ends thinking, uh, but we also have dark, dark parts of our character and our mind and our traditions that often influence our actions. People are not pretty. Human nature is not lovely. Human nature sometimes is decent and rational, but we also have a capacity for violence, for cruelty, for unspeakable cruelty. And we have to, we develop, we have to develop institutions which restrain that cruelty, that meanness, that bloodthirstiness. That's what institutional life should be about. It should be about releasing, emancipating our good natures and crippling our bad natures. Uh, and sometimes we have political leaders who do the opposite. And I think Donald Trump did the opposite. I think he's not the only one. The warmongers in our history were not people who were good for the emancipation of the good parts of our nature. But we can't, anyway, I, I, I don't want to go on about this because it sounds so religious. <laughs> well, the history of rationalism in the U.S. is well, well recorded. <laughs> And I think, yeah, I think that's pretty profound. Um, maybe it's just because I'm, you know, teaching a class on 18th and 19th century philosophy to some of the students in this call. Um, but also, uh, that seems right. And I think maybe maybe that's, I, not seeing any further questions, unless there's anyone else, maybe that's where we should end of, you know, imagining, engaging, uh, acting on political structures that emancipate our good natures and cripple our bad. Um, so on that note, um, let me just say uh, from all of us, uh, thank you. And, and, you know, people express your appreciation for, for Francis, um, who is just as sharp an analyst as one can hear and as inspiring a thinker. Um, thank you so much uh, for your evening, Fran. And uh, <laughs> I love I love the comment. Incredibly interesting, depressing, inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming, listening, and talking to me. Pleasure. Um, and I will say, just last plug is um, we have our very last lecture of the season is on December the fifth. Um, it is a lecture by. Uh, Nivedita Majumdar, who is a professor of literature at CUNY, um, on her book on post-colonial theory called The World in a Grain of Sand, arguing for a new radical universalism. Um, so I'll put the RSVP link in the chat um, for that, and you'll probably get an email from us. Um, uh, so thank you again, Francis, um, and uh, to all on a somewhat more hopeful note. Um, yeah, it's better. It's better. Today is better than it was the day before yesterday. It's a better time. So enjoy that and work to make it better still. Thanks all. Have a good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>